It is 1999, a shockwave hits America. Two high school boys in trench coats carrying shotguns, a semi-automatic weapon, and homemade bombs walk into their school and begin the slaughter of their classmates, who were sitting on the grass eating their lunch, who were hiding under tables, no defense from the terror. 13 are killed, 24 are wounded. And we are all watching for the first time. Children run out of their school fleeing mayhem. For the first time, we see a wounded student struggling out the window of his high school to escape with his life. And for the years to come, we would all be asking the same questions. Who were these killers? And what kind of parents could produce children like these? Someone wasn't doing their job. For 17 years now, the parents of Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris have lived their secrets, unwilling to step forward. Until a gray-haired woman makes her way into a room. In the course of this day, at one point, we see her pacing, perhaps grappling with her decision to step forward after all these years hiding from cameras, years of being hated and threatened. She says, afraid and ashamed. Sue Klebold is now 66 years old. Okay, camera, sleep. For the families of 13 people who died and mm -hmm. 24 people who were injured, most of them children. Yes. What is it you want to say to them? The one thing, of course, that I want to say is I am so sorry for what my son did. Yet I know that just saying I'm sorry is such an inadequate response to all this suffering. There is never a day that goes by where I don't think of the people that Dylan harmed. And I- You use the word harm. harmed. I think it's easier for me to say harmed than killed. And, and it's still hard for me after all this time. Is that about a certain need to deny what happened or? I don't know, perhaps, perhaps. Um, it is very hard to live with the fact that someone you loved and raised has brutally killed people in such a horrific way. The last moments of his life were spent in violence, sadism. You know, he was cruel and hateful, and, um, and I have to own that. I just remember sitting there and reading about them. All these kids and the teacher. And I keep thinking, constantly thought, how I would feel if it were the other way around and one of their children had shot mine. I would feel exactly the way they did. I know I would. I know I would. You blame the parents for being out. For all the parents who have said, well, I would have known something. I know. I would have just known. Before Columbine happened, I would have been one of those parents. <laughs> I think we like to believe that our love and our understanding is protective, and that if anything were wrong with my kids, I would know. But I didn't know, and I wasn't able to stop his hurting other people. And I wasn't able to stop his hurting himself. And uh, it's very hard to live with that. Called him the sunshine boy? We did when he was little, yeah. He had this sort of a mane of golden hair, and it was just always thick and round. And he was such a happy, precocious, brilliant little child. She seems to be trapped in a contradiction. The son she once had, the murderer he became. She has written a book called A Mother's Reckoning. In it, she says all the lessons of her regret, which began on the day she woke up an ordinary wife and mother. Fast forward 24 hours, and I was the mother of a hate-crazed gunman. On April 20th, she was at the office where she works helping disabled college students. Right after noon, 12.05, her husband Tom, a geophysicist who works from home, calls and says it's an emergency. His voice sounded horrible, jagged, breathless. Something terrible is going on at the school. 
911, what's your emergency? He tells her two killers wearing trench coats are shooting kids at Columbine High School. One of Dylan's friends has called worried that Dylan might be involved. He wasn't there for morning class, and he wears a trench coat. Tom races through the house, hoping against hope to find that coat. You always think somebody's making a mistake. It's not there. My first thought was Dylan may be in danger. You know, what, who are these people that are hurting people? She has to drive 26 miles to get home, thoughts racing. Hyperventilating, trying to talk myself down. She arrives home. It's official. Her son Dylan is believed to be one of the shooters, and the shooting may not be over yet. In that moment, she says, a searing prayer. No parent thinks they could ever pray. The police were there, and the helicopters were going over. And I remember thinking, if this is true, if Dylan is really hurting people, he has to, somehow he has to be stopped. And then at that moment, I prayed that he would die, that God, stop this. Just make it stop. Don't let him hurt anybody. And so her quest begins. She says she goes back over every year of her life with a magnifying glass, looking for the path of her son's descent and the clues to all the things she missed.